Introduction to Rebirth of Spain The French Revolution opened a new era in Europe. How can Spain, with its peninsula shrouded in gunpowder, walk out of a different future? Chapter 1 News from Morocco You are listening at NovelFull.audio 1788, Kingdom of Spain, Madrid The streets are narrow and dark, with nearly 200,000 residents crowded into relatively small areas within the city walls. The rulers of the Bourbon dynasty are gradually changing it, but it still has a disappointing southern European urban style, looking like a second-rate Paris or Berlin a palace located on a hill on the left bank of the Manzanos River in western Madrid, with a typical French-style exterior, magnificent and spectacular, the interior decoration is authentic Italian style, luxurious and unparalleled. The palace houses a large collection of cultural relics and artworks such as oil paintings, tapestries, and ancient furniture, like an art treasure trove. Its owner was Carlos III, the four monarchs of the Kingdom of Spain. Although the old man was weak, his eyes were still bright and focused as he looked at the map of Spain. The red mark in the bottom left corner deeply hurt his eyes. However, news from the front line has dimmed the dazzling red color quite a bit. The army of the prince and lieutenant general Ricardos broke through the army of 20,000 Moroccans in Shavarif, and the prince personally commanded the prince's artillery regiment to take the lead, coordinating the infantry and cavalry regiments to kill, injure, and capture 3,000 prisoners of war. It was truly remarkable, praised José Manrino, the first minister of state of Spain, without any pretense. The king looked at the war report but didn't speak. Although he has never commanded an army on the front line, he also knows that his grandson is exceptionally intelligent and has a unique talent. The Prince Artillery Regiment was the first in Spain to adopt the French GRABO VAR system, with only three types of field guns and a unified field artillery vehicle consisting of two horses. Due to the significant weight reduction of both artillery and artillery vehicles, the deployment and mobility of artillery are more flexible. The defeat of the Moroccans in Shavarif this time was due to the flexible artillery output, and the Moroccans were hit by high-altitude artillery in both attack and passive defense. Send a wave of commendation to the frontline army this time. By the way, show me the map. Where are they preparing to go? The prince suggested that we go all the way to Meknes, the capital of the Moroccans, and force them to sign a treaty under the city, said José Marino. This is just nonsense. The journey from Port Ceuta to Meknes is nearly 186 miles. As the heir of the kingdom, how can we be in danger? The king, who was not happy for long, immediately cooled down. Jose Manrino naturally understood the king's concerns, after all, among all the king's descendants, only the son of the late eldest son, the Duke of Calabria, was outstanding in both character and talent. The second son of the king was a lazy and short dot sighted person, and the court of Naples was ruled by the queen and favored courtiers, the third son is also an indecisive person who is influenced by his own wife. And he himself is also very supportive of Prince Alfonso. Your Majesty, if you do not make a stance of not attacking the city of Meknes, it may not be easy for the Moroccans to yield, and the kingdom's attempt to dominate the southern coast of the Strait of Gibraltar will be in vain. Manrino reminded the king. According to the previous plan of Spain, after the Spanish army entered Morocco, they had to seize the opportunity to fight several major battles, creating a strong momentum and laying the foundation for the Spanish government to obtain more land in northern Morocco. The current port of Ceuta has a very small area and has not become the foundation for a large port or military fortress. In the North American War, Spain was unable to regain Gibraltar from Britain, but in the Treaty of Versailles, at Spain's request, Spain received a written commitment from Britain not to interfere with Spain's right of action in the Strait and North African coast for ten years. In addition, with the outbreak of the Near East War in 1787, the attention of the British shifted. They feared the expansion of Russian power and instead linked Prussia and the Netherlands, greatly facilitating Spain's actions in Morocco. Therefore, in June of this year, they declared war on Morocco on the grounds of inhumane treatment of Catholics. Then let Alfonso come back. 
I believe Ricardos can complete this mission, the king replied after thinking for a moment. Okay, I'll send someone to contact you immediately, Jose Marino nodded. At this moment, on the front line, the protagonists in their mouths are engaged in a verbal battle with the envoy sent by Morocco. At present, the Spanish army is stationed about 60 miles away from Fez and Minex in Morocco. Because Fez is the religious capital of Morocco and was once the capital of Morocco, King Abdullah of Morocco saw that he could not defeat the European aggressors and decided to test them out. However, when Alfonso, representing Spain, made a request to the Moroccans to cede land north of 34 degrees north latitude, the Moroccans felt so uneasy. Under normal circumstances, they are unwilling to make such concessions, to the point where their capital and holy city are in danger. Even if Spain had already hired a special envoy from the Governor-General of Algeria as an intermediary, it was useless to find a book garden www.chaoshuyuan.com. Moroccans insist on ceding land, but are only willing to cede less than 200 square kilometers of land around the city of Tangier. In addition, in Ceuta, they can also cede some land, approximately over 100 square kilometers. Moroccans are so stubborn that Alfonso is very unhappy. No one in this world knows that Alfonso Felipe Carlos de Bourbon, the grandson of King Carlos III of Spain and the son of the Duke of Calabria, is a traveler who does not exist in history. Compared to his colleagues who complain, Alfonso accepts it very well. After all, he has a noble identity and will continue to be the heir of the kingdom. He has worry-free clothing, food, housing, and transportation, and can also play the real life version of European Storm. As a traveler, Alfonso influenced many things since 1780 with his acquired knowledge. For example, in diplomacy, Spain voluntarily abandoned the failed siege of Gibraltar in exchange for British recognition of Spain's actions along the coast of Morocco. According to Alfonso's idea, as long as Spain takes Tangier, except for Gibraltar, this golden waterway connecting the Mediterranean and Atlantic will be completely controlled by the Spanish. Think about it, what great benefits and influence this is. At this time, the sea power consciousness of various countries did not awaken. The French and Austrians attached great importance to European hegemony, while the Russians did not even rush out of the Black Sea. The British may have noticed, but they were more concerned about the West Indies in the Atlantic. Therefore, taking advantage of this opportunity, Alfonso needs to find ways to expand the depth of the inland hinterland of the port of Ceuta and also take over the already semi-abandoned Tangier port. Forcing Moroccans to cede land north of 34 degrees north latitude was a springboard for future colonization of Morocco. Chapter 2 Christmas Gifts You are listening at NovelFull.audio the two-dot-week-long negotiations have worn away Alfonso's patience, and of course, the news from Madrid's fast horse has made Alfonso feel that he cannot continue like this, as he needs to prepare a different Christmas gift for his grandfather. In August, a new batch of Spanish reinforcements arrived, with approximately 5,000 people arranged by General Ricardos to transport supplies and supplies from the rear, and to search and suppress small groups of Moroccan soldiers who had infiltrated. And the veteran generals who were liberated were also unambiguous, advancing southward and defeating a Moroccan army of thousands. Although Moroccans used complex terrain for slow resistance and dispatched cavalry to constantly raid the rear, overall they did not cause much casualties to the vigilant Spaniards. The logistic soldiers arranged a large number of carriages in the rest camp of the military camp, effectively preventing them from being suddenly attacked by Moroccan cavalry at night. At the same time, Alfonso also noticed that the army commanded by King Abdullah of Morocco was decreasing. In this era, Morocco was still a semi-nomadic and semi-tribal feudal country. Although their ancestors were brilliant, they could not withstand corruption. The Alawite dynasty of Morocco began to rapidly decline after completing the unification of Morocco in the early 18th century. Due to the tribal system and the lack of strict inheritance laws, Morocco entered a half-century-long struggle for the throne. Abdullah was a lucky person who stood out from the royal battlefield. However, 
half a century of internal turmoil has led to the growth of local forces, and Minex's orders have not been able to command tribal leaders in other regions. To this day, King Abdullah only controls the capital Minex and the area around Fez. On October 25, the Spanish army arrived at a place only one day away from Fez. Moroccans used the mountainous terrain to gather large groups of people and set up defenses layer by layer. Just as General Ricardos began pre-war mobilization, he forcefully attacked these Moroccan fortifications, preparing to bear the cost of about a thousand casualties. A special envoy arrived from the city of Meknes under a white flag, requesting both sides to return to the negotiating table. Alva Rez, who had been accompanying Prince Alfonso and persuading him to return to the rear, was overjoyed and was also the real responsible negotiator. The negotiations have started, but Alfonso himself is not idle either. The army allows the army to provide military supplies, and Alfonso is a supporter of Jerron Bates' military philosophy. His book, General Theory of Tactics, has always been the most frequently seen book around Alfonso. Jerron Bate believes that the army should simplify, pursue mobile warfare, rely on food for the enemy, support war through war, and solve problems on the spot. In this way, the military can be liberated, thus achieving the goal of mobile warfare. Unlike the coastal hills of Morocco in the north, Fez is located in the northwest plain of Morocco and is a prime agricultural region. It is also a religious holy city in Morocco, where green monks hold centuries of Moroccan privileges and accumulate considerable wealth. Alva Rez turned a blind eye to the actions of the Spanish army, after all, food and supplies were transported from the homeland and needed to be transported through the hills of northern Morocco, making maintenance costs expensive. In order to save money, as well as hostility towards pagans, he closed his eyes. When the army was plundering nearby wealth, Alfonso did not forget to add chips to his side for war. Morocco and Spain are very similar, and the country's political system is mainly supported by tribal elites and religious monks. However, Morocco did not have any doubts about theocracy from the Enlightenment movement, and theocracy is almost on par with monarchy. Therefore, Alfonso directly arrested a large number of monks from nearby city temples through collusion. It goes without saying that many of these people were related to the powerful figures of Fez and Minex. Once taken away, the Moroccan monarchs and courtiers of Minex can imagine how much pressure they would bear. In early November, a secret meeting involving officials from Morocco and Spain was held outside the city of Fez. At this point, the negotiations were much smoother, as Moroccans agreed to abandon the coastal towns of northern Morocco, including Larash, Detuan, Chefchaouen, Huzima, and other northern Moroccan towns that were taken over by Spain. In addition, as requested by the Spanish, the Moroccan government compensated 2 million pesos, including Spain's military expenses and the priests' compensation. After the session and compensation, it was Alfonso's strong demand for Alvarez to add, which was to open the domestic market of Morocco to Spanish goods. Morocco could not unilaterally set import and export tariff rates, and Spanish goods could not be subject to additional harsh taxes and levies during transportation within Morocco. Spanish merchants and missionaries could freely enter and exit Morocco. The development of Spanish industry, commerce, and foreign trade is the long-term benefit for our country, unlike the one-time compensation. Spain's industrial products cannot compete with British machine production in terms of competitiveness, and it is also very difficult to compete with the French for the Mediterranean market. Currently, Spain's industry is driven by the free trade market in the Americas. We can find the next market for Spain's industrial products, which is a significant good news for Spain's domestic industry and commerce. Alfonso successfully convinced Alva Rez that Spain currently adheres to mercantilism, heavy industry, and state intervention, and the development goal is national prosperity. Although Morocco's market is small, it is also meat that can feed Spain's industry. As for the last point, it is naturally for Spain to expand its war against Morocco in the future and find the next excuse. Spain has repeatedly engaged in wars on the grounds of religion, which is the most familiar to Spain. 
Alfonso naturally needs to make good use of it. On November 15, Spain and Morocco signed an agreement inside a mosque outside the city of Fez. The agreement is called the Treaty of Friendship and Peace between the Kingdom of Spain and the Sultanate of Morocco. The next days will be for Alvarez and others to supervise Morocco's implementation of the peace treaty. There is no reason for Alfonso to continue staying here, of course, the most important reason is. The king is seriously ill, and his royal highness will be away for almost half a year. His majesty is very concerned about your safety in Morocco. God is in favor of the kingdom's North African cause, and we have achieved the greatest victory of this century. Please personally report this good news to the king. Alva Rez once again requested Alfonso to return to his country. And Alfonso did not refuse this time, after all, counting the days, I'm afraid the old man is also about to arrive at that time. Although he had anticipated it earlier, his heart still feels a bit sour. With this Christmas gift prepared for Carlos III, he embarked on his journey back. Chapter 3 Carlos III. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Madrid in December is cold and rainy, with a strong sense of winter. The carriage passed through the majestic Alcala Gate and arrived at the spacious Alcala Street, with fewer pedestrians on the road compared to the summer before the expedition. The Madrid Palace is very close to the Alcaral Gate, and Alfonso soon saw his familiar roof, followed by the palace's arsenal square. The style of the guards in the Armory Square remains the same. They are the palace guards responsible for guarding the palace, but from their expressions, Alfonso can still see that a few soldiers have sad faces. Alfonso knew the reason, because Carlos III was different from other European monarchs. When people accepted that monarchs must wear robes and other formal attire, Carlos III's later rule was unique, preferring to use hunting attire instead of the king's attire. The only symbol of royal power was a ribbon wrapped around his chest. Spanish court painter Goya once painted a picture of Carlos III wearing a hunting suit, holding a gun in his hand, and a dog lying under his feet. Perhaps in ordinary eyes, this is just a portrait of an ordinary hunter. And this is also a new monarchy spirit expressed by Carlos III. The monarch who is close to his people. The father of his homeland. He was the greatest enlightened monarch of Spain in the 18th century, Carlos III. During his tenure, he appointed people from average backgrounds to important positions, expelled Jesuits who hindered colonial centralization, cracked down on religious authority, and strengthened Madrid's authority, vigorously expanding the navy militarily and maintaining Spain's position as a maritime power, during the European Royal War, closely following France north of the Pyrenees to ensure the security of Spain's colonies the economic openness of colonial trade benefited the entire country, and Spain's manufacturing industry recovered. Since the peace of 1783, market.oriented agriculture and manufacturing have met the needs of Spanish cities and foreign countries, and Spain's exports to colonies have doubled before the war. Over the span of a generation, educated Spaniards have experienced a long-lost era of national prosperity. It can be said that Carlos III was the most successful monarch in the current Bourbon dynasty. Although there were regrets for Gibraltar, he led Spain into the path of revival, and even the palace guards were inevitably saddened by the king's serious illness. This day was very cold, even in a well-kept palace, Alfonso still felt a hint of chill. Alfonso followed the imperial physician to understand the king's physical condition. At the door of the room was Alfonso's second uncle Francisco, who shook his head at Alfonso, clearly indicating something. Carlos III was born in 1716 and is currently at the age of 72. In 18th century Europe, he can be considered one of the longest lived monarchs. However, old age also represents various complications of old age, with hypertension and other chronic diseases emerging one after another. When Alfonso saw the king lying in bed, his hearing clearly deteriorated. He didn't notice himself and looked out the window. Alfonso vaguely saw that the king was even thinner than before, and his profile was only haggard because he didn't wear a wig. 
all the king's sparse hair also told Alfonso about his physical condition. At this moment, the palace maids next to him were massaging the king, indicating that the king hadn't gotten out of bed for quite some time. Grandpa, I'm back. Alfonso said aloud. The king's body moved and he turned to see his beloved grandson. His face suddenly turned red and he said, Child, you're back. Let me see if you've been to Morocco and bumped into him. Grandpa, I'm fine. On the contrary, I brought back the most suitable Christmas gift for you. The Moroccans surrendered and we obtained the land of North Morocco. Soon the whole city will receive news, and everyone will cheer for Grandpa. Alfonso thought of Christmas coming soon and blurted out. It's you who's amazing. I've read countless war reports, but I didn't expect the French artillery reform to have such a big impact. I didn't see you wrong, you're the best heir to the kingdom. I think you'll be 18 years old next year, and there's no need to arrange a regent. Carlos III had his own words to say. Grandpa. Alfonso felt a bit lost. Child, I once said to your uncle, Carlos, who inherited the throne of Naples, this sentence. Make good use of the sword that Louis XIV gave to your grandfather Felipe. You must use it to protect our faith, your people, and your country. However, Carlos obviously did not do this, and he disappointed me. Child, I won't ask, can you do it, because I believe you can do it, tell me what you want your Spain to be like. Carlos III asked. In my heart, Alfonso couldn't help but think of the most prosperous time in Spain's history. At that time, King Carlos V of the Habsburg dynasty not only ruled over the lowlands of the Netherlands and Sicily, but also over Lombardy in northern Italy, Austria and Bohemia in Central Europe. Its territory spread throughout Western Europe, Central Europe, Southern Europe, and with the colonial empires in the Americas, it was truly a world empire. However, history has become dust, and the Habsburg dynasty has become extinct, just like the European empire that destroyed Spain. The Bourbon dynasty retreated to southern Europe, making it very difficult to even recover Gibraltar at their doorstep. Alfonso speculated that Carlos III, who ascended to the throne as the king of Spain in his middle age, clearly hoped to show his strength. However, the failure of the Seven Years' War forced him to start with internal reforms. After more than 20 years of reform, Spain's national strength has significantly improved. However, compared to his past self, the gap between Spain and the current mainstream European powers, such as Britain and France, is still significant. In my heart, Spain is not afraid of the British at sea, and not afraid of the French on land. I want to rebuild a new European empire belonging to Spain, not the European empire of Carlos V, but the Mediterranean empire of the Bourbon dynasty. I will not pursue things that do not belong to Spain, but I will not allow any enemies or friends to interfere with things around Spain. Regarding the general direction of Spain's country, Alfonso had some thoughts and had preliminary ideas, but it is obviously not yet time to bring them to the table. However, in front of Carlos III, Alfonso does not mind revealing his own ideas. Having ambition and dreams. British and French, your father has always been under the shadow of these two great powers, hoping that you can go out, said Carlos III with heartfelt blessings. Yes, Grandpa. As long as I live in the world, I will strive for this goal. I have nothing to say, just one suggestion. Don't be reckless, listen to the opinions of others more, there will be unexpected gains. Carlos III sent his final message. Chapter 4 Future Planning You are listening at NovelFull.audio Carlos III ultimately missed Christmas in 1788 when all the bells in Madrid rang, announcing the death of the king. The nobles in the palace dressed the king's body and placed it in a wooden coffin, covered in a magnificent golden color, before placing it in a larger lead coffin. The envoy of the Holy See prayed for the deceased king, and people wept as they watched the funeral procession drive from the palace gate towards the Escoria Palace. The king's body will be transported north to the corruption chamber and placed in a solemn manner. 
the captain of the king's guard interrupted his battle because the king he was guarding was no longer alive. The guards fired their guns three times, and the bell at the Escoria palace rang mournfully as the deceased spoke. Alfonso was involved in the entire process and had an indescribable complexity in his heart. The death of Carlos III in history deprived Spain of the last hope of enlightenment and reform, putting an end to Spain's progress. Alfonso often thinks of the upcoming French Revolution next year, where wars on land and sea torment this country. The people who have suffered from foreign aggression are forced to stand up and resist. The crown of Bourbon has been stolen, and people have also suffered from five years of war. In the end, only dilapidated cities and beacon colonies remain. In the next 100 years, Spain once again fell into the mud of the last century's sinking, corruption, and war, without any change, and the world's earliest empire that never set sun finally set. How should I do it myself? Alfonso returned to the Madrid palace and sat at his desk. According to the historical context, there are two paths for oneself to take. The simplest way is to flatter France and drag on until the winter when the French defeated Russia, and then launch a Jedi counterattack. However, this road is very serious. Not to mention flattering France, Spain will inevitably stand on the opposite side of Britain. The French will also give Spain a good face, after all, Spain is also a Bourbon dynasty, and there is a natural sense of distrust. In history, Spain was not only an ally and brother of the French, but also a deliberate invasion by the French in the end. In addition, with my identity as a traveler, since God has given me such a unique and exquisite experience, if I don't make good use of it and change Spain's national fortune, I would be very sorry for myself as a future visitor. At this point, Alfonso also hoped to embark on a different path. Alfonso analyzed the current situation in France. The storm of the Great Revolution was inevitable, and the conflict between the king and the privileged class had heated up. Louis XVI, in order to solve the financial crisis, listened to Jacques Necker's suggestion and decided to convene a third-level conference. Following the example of ancestors in the 15th century, he decided to use the power of the people to force concessions from the privileged class. However, what they did not know was that, after a century of capitalist economic development and enlightenment, emerging forces emerged in the third class and began to pursue equal political power. The kings and privileged classes who played with the third class as tools of struggle suddenly realized that they had already begun to dig graves for themselves. Since the outbreak of the French Revolution was inevitable, Alfonso needs to examine why Spain has failed so much in history. After all, both Prussia and Austria have been defeated by the French, but they have not suffered as much as Spain. Firstly, Spain's strategic approach has been very rough. In history, Carlos IV not only failed to handle national affairs, but also acted recklessly in foreign diplomacy. The fear of revolution led Spain to join the anti-French alliance, but the French, who were unaware of breaking the shackles of feudalism, erupted in unprecedented patriotic mobilization. Spain defeated the Pyrenees and had to sign a peace treaty with France in order to protect domestic security. If the reason why Carlos IV and his people pleaded guilty to France was to have self-awareness and preserve their strength, then the subsequent conquests against Portugal and Britain, as well as the blind obedience to France, were entirely due to diplomatic stubbornness. In 1804, the most powerful navy in the world was destroyed and Spain completely lost its maritime dominance. Later, Spain was discovered by the French, who were concerned about the power of France and supported their relatives and subordinates to ascend various newly established national thrones. As a result, they attempted to re-enter the anti-French cause, which gave the French ample reason to clean up Spain. At this point, Spain has offended all its neighbors on both sides. If it weren't for France's inability to tame the traditional and patriotic Spaniards, it would probably be possible for Spain to change its surname to Bonaparte. Secondly, Spain's own national strength has declined. In the late 1780s, although the two countries north and south of the Pyrenees were no longer comparable, it was widely believed that Spain, which had undergone enlightened reforms, had the strength to confront France head on. 
but by the early 1800s, few people were likely to have the same idea. When France's bloodthirsty army was recklessly attacking the old order in Central and Eastern Europe, Spain could not even deal with Portugal and often needed the French to wipe their buttocks. France's only painful failure The escalating naval battle in Trafalgar Occurred with the participation of Spain Later, even a slight glance at the navy of Spain was completely destroyed, no wonder it was looked down upon by the French, causing them to have the wrong thoughts. Of course, this was also the fault of Carlos IV, who was both lenient and strict. His rule was characterized by military prowess, not to mention his favorite courtiers and queens who acted recklessly. He saw the strength of the French in various countries and self-improved internally, while Spain was gradually self-proclaimed by the conservative elites in the upper echelons. In addition, there were other factors, such as the internal conflicts within the Bourbon royal family at that time, the long-term neglect of land and navy, and the lack of a strong organizational government during the war. Alfonso couldn't help but smile bitterly when he saw that he had listed so many reasons. But it's okay, the French are not yet as strong as they were after 1804, and as kings, they have enough resources to mobilize this country. A week and a half later on Christmas, although it was still a cold winter, the celebration of the king's accession diluted the sadness of the old king's passing at the beginning of the month. Everyone changed into new clothes and guarded on both sides of the main street in the city, waving their hands to welcome their new king. Because during the enthronement banquet, the palace will also present food and wine to all citizens. In the Royal Church of St. Geronimo, Alfonso listened to the blessings of Archbishop Antonio Gregory of Toledo, and the audience was focused on watching the moment of this envoy. When Archbishop Toledo handed over the crown and scepter symbolizing royal power to Alfonso, he turned around and everyone on stage stood up. The envoys from various countries who were observing the ceremony expressed their blessings to the King of Spain and greetings on behalf of the royal families of various countries. Alfonso watched everyone bow and bow under his own gaze, and at that moment, Spain entered a new era. The Era of Alfonso XII Chapter 5 Artillery and Problems You are listening at NovelFull.audio At the beginning of 1789, the traditional dynastic war was still staged in Europe. Russia and Austria had their eyes on Turkey as land in the Balkans. At the end of December last year, the Russian army occupied Akajiv, reorganized all the forces fighting against Turkey into a southern group army, and attacked Pisarabia. Austria took advantage of the situation and surrounded the fortress in Belgrade, with a massive army of over 230,000 scattered between the Dniester River and the Adriatic Sea. Britain was concerned about the victory of Russia and Austria, which would affect its interests in the Baltic Sea and trade in the Levant, and spared no effort to support Sweden's attack on Russia in the Nordic region. In order to lift Denmark's threat to southern Sweden, Britain joined forces with Prussia to threaten Denmark and force it to abandon its actions in the war. Almost all major European countries are involved, with only two countries taking no action. One is France and Western Europe, which, due to its internal financial pressure, is unable to participate in the affairs of its old Eastern allies and is shrinking in an increasing number of external activities, another is Spain in Southern Europe, which is undergoing internal reforms. The Moroccan War proved the superiority of the French Gribble War artillery system, and as a result, the system was comprehensively introduced. With the advancement of casting gun technology and ammunition technology, the Gribble War new 12-pound gun produced by the Selvia Military Industry Factory is not only lighter than the old model, but also has a firing rate of up to three rounds per minute, which is three times that of the old artillery. Moreover, Due to its unique ballistic characteristics, it can partially replace the functions of former mortar guns. General Antonio Ricardos, who returned from the victorious Moroccan War, was promoted to general by Alfonso. After Alfonso ascended the throne, he was appointed to be specifically responsible for the reform of Spanish artillery. A large number of old Spanish artillery were eliminated, and artillery, artillery vehicles, ammunition boxes, sights, and even artillery tools underwent earth-shattering changes. 
the Selvaya military industry factory needs to cast 1,200 new copper 12-pound, 8-pound, and 4-pound guns, over 1,300 gun racks, and over 2,000 front and ammunition trucks. According to General Ricardos's estimate, Spain will form six artillery regiments, five engineering companies, and nine maintenance companies, with a regular staffing of 7,663 personnel. Of course, Alfonso, who is well informed, will not be fooled solely by the successful artillery system of the French. Everything has its flaws. For example, Batiste Gribbelwar lacked cavalry and artillery units. Throughout the 18th century, in order to make the artillery reach designated locations as soon as possible, countless novel suggestions emerged and a large number of experiments were conducted. Frederick the Great's Prussian army was the first to eat crabs. Frederick the Great established an artillery battalion with six six-dot-pound guns, each pulled by six horses, paired with two horses, and controlled by three drivers. There is also a detachment consisting of seven cavalry artillery soldiers. Although this unit suffered devastating blows in the subsequent battles, it was largely caused by their unreliable controllers. However, Frederick was convinced that Mara artillery was indispensable in his tactical system, so this organization continued throughout the Prussian army. Later, various countries followed suit one after another, except for France, which was delayed due to its inability to receive widespread support, and even Spain, which was studying Prussia, had it. Of course, Spain is more advanced than other countries. At Alfonso's request, all the artillery of Spain's horse-drawn cavalry must be able to ride horses. Every artillery unit is trained as cavalry, so the artillery can quickly advance to keep up with the cavalry unit and provide strong firepower support. Each artillery squadron is equipped with six four-dot-pound guns and one six-dot-inch howitzer. Because considering that as a highly efficient and integrated artillery system, General Ricardos's reforms required a large number of personnel, and Alfonso was also the first to allow civilian-born individuals to become senior officers in the artillery. In the Spanish army, noble officers have privileges and occupy most of the positions in the higher ranks. In theory, a person without a background can only be promoted to captain in Spain and stop there at most. For this point, the nobles are definitely against it, but unfortunately, artillery officers require you to have certain requirements for mathematical knowledge such as geodesy, orientation, mapping, and ammunition preparation. For such technical branches, you cannot expect those aristocratic officers in the army to learn. In France, most artillery officers are non-aristocratic. Therefore, Alfonso also took this opportunity to give ordinary Spanish people a pathway for promotion. For a country in military, the most taboo is stagnant water and a rigid system. Why did the revolutionary French look down upon them, while the anti-French alliance's army retreated consecutively? It is precisely because noble officers occupy the pit and are mostly mediocre, while the French have honed their military intelligence through their military achievements. There is no unbeatable reason to compare two rooms at the book garden www.jiaoshuyuan.com. However, this issue is not yet the biggest one, but rather the shortage of Spanish military personnel is the biggest and most urgent issue. After General Ricardos's artillery reform first entered the regular system, the issue of human recruitment began to be exposed. Artillery recruitment has not been able to be completed 100%, Although it may be due to artillery requiring certain skills, this type of problem is a common problem in the military. Regarding the technical issues of artillery, we can include the Royal Military Academy in Madrid in the new artillery curriculum, but the personnel issue cannot be solved. Our military has low salaries and very few suitable volunteers. Moreover, due to the issue of exemption rights, the most recruited are still those who are poor and lack land. Most of them are illiterate, and joining artillery is not as good as being an ordinary line infantry. In the past, we relied on foreigners to fill the shortage of artillery quotas, but in recent years, the number of foreign volunteers has significantly declined. The first king attempted to change the national conscription, but more people chose to flee. 
young people fled to the mountains to hide in military service, or hide in churches, and military arrests have become a common practice during our conscription. Ricardos has been in the military for many years and fully understands the current situation of the military. Why not improve the treatment of soldiers? They fight for their own country because they deserve the country's reward. Alfonso was puzzled. However, looking back, Alfonso understood the answer. In the feudal monarchy era of Europe, the army in the hands of the monarchs was just his tool. Who would pay a high price for tools? After all, finding someone to join the army and directly arresting them was enough. This phenomenon was not only in Spain, but also in post-bourgeois revolution England where people were arrested for naval service. The army of the king and the army of the state are two different concepts. Chapter 6 Military Reform Commission You are listening at NovelFull.audio The military is the greatest protection of the country, and after ascending the throne, Alfonso has always regarded it as his top priority. This is also why he was very enthusiastic about artillery reform as soon as he ascended the throne. Obviously, the military problems exposed by artillery reform need to be solved more. Otherwise, waiting for the enemy to attack your doorstep will probably make you sigh. On February 18, 1789, Alfonso ordered the formation of the Military Constitution and Reform Committee, consisting of 23 senior generals with war experience. General Antonio Ricardos serves as the chairman of the committee, responsible for reviewing the composition, size, logistics, recruitment, training, and tactics of the military. As for the direction of reform, predecessors in military research have actually provided answers for a long time. Why did the French army become so strong after the Great Revolution? It was because they had already stood on the shoulders of several generations of French military strategists. They have all made various reforms to address the difficulties. It is their theoretical basis and practical results that have achieved the French Empire dream of Corsican youth. Alfonso, who enjoys reading, has reviewed many contemporary books. In the 18th century, when there was a lack of modern entertainment activities, reading became Alfonso's most leisure and activity. The Austrian War of the Throne, written by Marshal Maurice Saxe, which helped France achieve a comeback, advocated for universal military service and required all eligible citizens to serve for five years. The military should provide good treatment to grassroots soldiers and should not rely on their background to make decisions when promoting officers. In addition, he suggested abolishing the single-unit battalion military system and establishing a new type of army composed of cavalry, infantry, artillery, and engineers. These ideas were later accepted by the French army during the Great Revolution and became the embryonic form of division-level units in modern armies. Another example is the General Theory of Tactics by French military philosopher Guibert, which can be said to compare the National Army more thoroughly to Maurice Saxe, believing that it is necessary to mobilize the political enthusiasm of everyone and build a national army that is superior in both military quality and quantity. Because in the old monarchy era, most wars were handed over to a small number of professional soldiers. The result is that the people have no concern for war, and many non-military nobles do not attach importance to research in military science. Beckett confidently wrote that once a new type of national army is established, it will inevitably sweep away these old and rigid armed forces. Regarding the war itself, Gilbert emphasized that movement has overcome siege warfare. He pointed out sharply that the demoralized royal armies often turned wars into money-consuming games. The citizens spent a large amount of taxes on building civil works, maintaining the operation of cannons, and other expenses during the siege period. Soldiers stay in scattered fortresses, becoming passive and cowardly due to the suppression of time. In his view, a brave and resolute army should concentrate its forces to the maximum extent, actively seek out the enemy's main force, and eliminate them on the battlefield. This can achieve victory in the war in the shortest possible time and minimize the economic pressure on the people. In history, with the arrival of the French Revolution and the formation of the Continental Anti-French Alliance, Gilbert's ideal army began to rapidly hatch. 
the technical guidance proposed by Marshal Saxe gave the new French Republic Army strong combat power. The theoretical explorations of the two generations were ultimately integrated into a comprehensive advantage in the hands of Emperor Corsica. Unfortunately, Gilbert, who is still serving as the chief military advisor of the French army, was unable to gain the trust of the conservative government and has not adopted his suggestions. Since we have direction, we need to execute it. However, Alfonso was already past the age of the second year of junior high school and did not intend to take it all at once. The French buried the royal family in privileged class with a revolution, while Alfonso did not want to set himself on fire. Ultimately, the king was just a special member of the aristocratic class. He prefers to boil frogs in warm water and make changes step by step. The first thing to do is to expel the useless noble generals from Spain. Officers became a way for nobles to extract pension benefits to avoid bankruptcy, and a large number of nobles were crammed into the ranks of officers. These officers have a strong feudal aristocratic habit, and five-sixths of them do not live in military camps at all. Even in military camps, they often carry a large amount of luggage and servants, bringing a heavy and unnecessary burden to the army. They sometimes take turns to command the army in order to share military salaries. Marshal Ricardos detested this matter very much, so the new officials took office and cut two-thirds of the nominal noble positions, resulting in a significant reduction in high military expenses. The nobles also resisted and complained about this reform, but Alfonso has been pretending to be deaf and mute about it. The saved military expenses are naturally used to increase the salaries and benefits of soldiers. Soldiers' meals need to be improved, and the issue of unpaid wages cannot occur in the Spanish military. In addition, additional allowances can be given as rewards. Rewards can be obtained through public gatherings, such as the book garden www.jaoshuyuan.com, for social newspapers to report and observe, and to improve people's stereotypes about the military. In Alfonso's view, material rewards are the most important incentive measure for the military, but public gatherings praising the military's dedication to the country are also essential. Because Spain participated in multiple dynastic wars in the past, the people ignored the Spanish wars and fled like tigers to the government's forced signs. Therefore, it is necessary to actively change society's prejudice against the military. Of course, the people have more than one prejudice against the military, and the biggest prejudice is the various severe punishment measures and countless small rules and regulations in the military. Since the Seven Years' War, the strong army of the Kingdom of Prussia has stood out, and the organization, training, and combat methods of the Spanish army have all learned from the system established by Frederick the Great of Prussia, just like other European countries at the same time, imitating the greatest warriors of the 18th century to create a recorded army. But it was this kind of army that allowed more Spaniards to escape, and even Alfonso shook his head when he saw those military regulations. They are required to be polite in society, wear uniforms in public places, maintain powder on their hair, and always dress neatly. They are prohibited from sitting down or smoking in public places, which is extremely painful for soldiers. It is said that the Spanish military detects it through the garbage on the butt of cigarettes or cigars. God knows, these soldiers used to experience being unpaid by the government, where did they get the money to buy brand new uniforms? Alfonso also demanded that inhumane punishments be appropriately reduced, and that the constraints on soldiers be focused on the military's combat effectiveness, rather than external surface pursuits. Corporal punishment is necessary, but we cannot put the cart before the horse. Alfonso put forward a series of suggestions, and the recorder beside him took note of them one by one and sent them to the Military Constitution and Reform Committee, where someone else would propose them. Chapter 7 Catholicization of Northern Morocco You are listening at NovelFull.audio After Spain occupied North Morocco last year, the government temporarily implemented military control to maintain social and order in the area. During the implementation of the Treaty of Fez by Moroccans, the delivery operation was quickly completed, and the military government began to rectify the Moroccans within the territory. 
Out of distrust of pagans, I believe that these Moroccans will become trouble for Spain in the future. The local military government began a large number of post-autumn accounts, that is, to arrest people who engaged in anti-Spanish behavior during the war. More than 60,000 Moroccans have been implicated as a whole, all of whom have been locked up in special military camps and organized into several road construction teams to renovate the infrastructure within the country. In mid-month, Spanish Prime Minister José Marino held a meeting to discuss the political status of North Morocco and decided to establish the province of North Morocco. After Felipe V completely suppressed localism, an administrative system representing the will of the king and central power was established in the former duchy and earl territory of Spain. These provincial governors are representatives of the king and exercise the power of the central government, which almost determines the general direction of Spain's future disposal of North Morocco. Localization Your Majesty, God has given me inspiration to believe that you are the protector of contemporary God, who has saved Christians from being oppressed by pagans. However, the local community still lives under the shadow of paganism, and our spirits cannot be liberated. We serve God and believe it is necessary to sprinkle the radiance of God on the dark North Africa. At daily court lunches, Archbishop Antonio Grigio of Toledo, Spain, visited the Madrid Palace. Spain's political system and monarchy have two pillars. The Church and the Nobility. Every time Carlos III dined publicly, he often sat with the Archbishop to show his closeness to the Church. And why he came to find the king is naturally for the matter of North Morocco. The ambition of Catholicism is to spread the gospel of God, whether it is in distant cities in China and India, or in the jungle indigenous tribes on the other side of the Atlantic, there are almost missionaries shuttling around to save the pagans. Of course, bread here carries the risk of life, but devout missionaries enjoy it both ways. North Morocco has a considerable group of pagans, which is a big cake for the Spanish Catholic Church. The cause of God in North Africa has always been obstructed by local pagan warlords, and Spain's few military strongholds are insufficient to support God's cause. Now Spain has achieved this. Your Majesty, you are the protector of God. Not only have you successfully saved the Christians in North Morocco, but you have also spread God's glory to the dark North Africa. If Cardinal Sith Neros is still alive, he will surely passionately praise your great cause. Gregor praised without any pretense. The victory of the Northern Moroccan War has made many Spaniards proud. When it comes to pagan wars, the Spaniards always give top priority. It can be foreseen how much glory Alfonso, who led the great hero of the Northern Moroccan War, has. Cardinal Sith Neros never forgot the Kingdom of North Africa during the reign of Felipe V. Isn't the responsibility of the king to protect the Spanish people and the church from persecution by outsiders? Alfonso replied generously, and now there is also an opportunity for God to promote it. The people of North Morocco are ignorant, do not want to progress, and always oppose the kingdom. In order to defend Spain's faith, I believe that the Spanish Catholic Church needs to take action to end the darkness of thought in North Morocco. Due to the early layout of independence for future colonies, Alfonso believed it was necessary to reduce the influence of pagans in the province of North Morocco to ensure the localization process of Spain in the area. Otherwise, religious conflicts between new immigrants and indigenous peoples would affect local development, which clearly required Catholicism to take the lead. You should know that the purification of Catholicism is very skilled. In history, Spain was once ruled by half of the Arab countries, and to this day, they are rarely seen in southern Spain. It is my honor to be valued by His Majesty, and I believe no missionary would refuse this mission, replied Gregor with great satisfaction, while also inquiring, I wonder if we need the religious tribunal granted by Queen Isabella II, which will make God's cause twice as efficient. No way. Alfonso didn't think too much and directly refused. The Inquisition can be said to be a term that has been completely stigmatized in later generations, and in this era, it is also worth letting more. Enlightenment thinkers spared no effort in criticizing the Inquisition, which also led to Carlos III not easily using it. 
Of course, Alfonso knows more, and Spain's rise and fall stem from religious courts. Initially, due to the de-Islamization and absolute monarchy, the Spanish monarchs established religious courts, which became tools to combat all heresy. They searched for the Shuyuan website www.jiaoshuyuan.com and extended the religious ideology of Catholic supremacy, even turning the king into a religious fanatic. Not to mention that the emergence of the Age of Discovery is due to the level of technological research and development. To continue to progress in the era of discovery, it is necessary to strengthen technological research and development. But Spain's strict religious policy, not to mention supporting technological research and development, is mainly targeted by skilled workers and artisans who ensure navigation activities. Although the renaissance of the 17th and 18th centuries, religious reform, and the spread of Enlightenment ideas weakened the theocracy represented by Catholicism, the Spanish Inquisition still exerted a formidable force in Spain's religious, cultural, and political life, however, in this case, God's cause will encounter obstacles from pagans, which is not conducive to God's glory. Gregory did not expect the king to be so decisive, indicating that the king and his grandfather Carlos III were of the same kind. Carlos III once wanted to depose the Inquisition, but faced opposition from conservatives. Just bring it under government control to ensure that the accused defense is well heard, and the punishment received is also relatively mild. Under the protection of the monarchy, the Enlightenment movement developed in Spain. As time went on, the religious courts in Spain remained closed. And the monarch in front of him is obviously also influenced by literature such as Voltaire. Don't worry, this mission will be carried out by the government. I will have Manlino issue a decree that all North Moroccans must convert to Catholicism, otherwise they will be expelled. Whether the remaining Christianized Moroccans truly believe is up to the Church. Alfonso doesn't want the religious tribunal to be released, and the government can do this on its own. Yes, Your Majesty. Gregor saw the king issue an order directly and was no longer constrained. Chapter 8 Roots You are listening at NovelFull.audio To fight, one must be tough on their own, and Alfonso has always known this truth. Not only Alfonso noticed, but also the ministers of the Spanish Encyclopedia movement. The economic reform in Spain started earlier than the Durgo reform in France in the 1860s. Economic works from England and France have begun to appear in Spanish translations, although religious courts prohibit such Enlightenment works. However, the upper class can still obtain these works through smuggling books and other means. The Enlightenment ideology deeply influenced reformist high-dot-ranking officials. Spain's basic policy for business is to encourage free markets. In the early days, industry associations in various parts of Spain, especially in Madrid, controlled and monopolized the entire industry. Spain also issued laws to abolish the monopoly rights of various guilds and replace them with free trade. Carlos III encouraged business development by lowering tax rates, reducing the overall sales tax in Madrid by 2%, and lowering the sales tax in Andalusia and Castile from 14% to 8% and 5% respectively. At the same time, Spain promotes domestic industrial development by implementing protective tariffs, subsidies, and direct investment from the royal family, and eliminates discrimination against businesses to enhance people's respect for such industries. Of course, what is more important is the lifting of restrictions on trading ports between the suzerainty and colonies, the deprivation of privileges from nobles and chartered merchants through reforms, and the liberalization of Atlantic trade, which has led to Spain's trade volume in the Americas surpassing that of England and France by 20 times. The main purpose of agricultural policy reform is to protect farmers and abolish the aristocratic privileges left over from the Middle Ages. The laws of the Middle Ages allowed nobles to freely graze on the land of farmers, and their property rights could not be protected. From 1766 to 1767, under the advocacy of José Marino and Campo Manes, Spanish legislation protected the property rights of farmers. In addition, 
Carlos III reduced transaction costs within Spain by constructing roads, encouraging foreign immigrants to cultivate barren land in the southwest, and requiring the city government to lease uncultivated public land under his name to farmers at the lowest actual rent. These policies have greatly improved the recovery of Spanish industry, commerce, and agriculture, but Alfonso knows that these are not enough because these reforms have not touched the deep waters, and the obstacles are caused by Spain's largest privileged class, the nobility, and the church. Intellectuals only saw that Spain, reformed by Carlos III, was very powerful, but economically highly dependent on traditional handicrafts and traditional farming, making it very fragile. In mid-March, Alfonso went to the estates around Madrid to see the nearby farms that provided food for Madrid. The estate economy is a characteristic of the Spanish agricultural economy, with nobles and churches occupying over 70% of Spain's land. The Toro Law of 1505 established the inheritance rights of the eldest son of the nobility over property and land, resulting in a long-term monopoly of land by the Spanish nobility and the formation of an estate system. Spanish farmers have a free legal identity, some of whom even own their own land and even become wealthy farmers. But more people become tenant farmers, earning a living on the edge of survival. Without sufficient land, they cannot guarantee their survival or pay the land rent and estate taxes demanded by the estate lords, church tithes, and the ability of the state to pay taxes. Most farmers, in order to make a living, can only obtain free quota seeds or other production materials as start.up funds through tenant contracts with lords. However, in farms near Madrid, at least half of the tenant farmers are unable to complete the contracts, lose collateral, and land. In the village of Loma near Madrid, when the harvest is good, farmers can supplement enough nutrition and calories by using grains. However, during bad times, they may even go hungry for several consecutive days, and high land rent needs to be deducted from the grain harvest. As a last resort, farmers need to borrow money to buy the food they produce and struggle. Unless the Lord is generous and tax.free, land users will have to bear heavy taxes. Although they were not serfs, the existence of estate jurisdiction prevented them from leaving. Spanish finance minister Campo Manes has always criticized the nobility and the church for controlling the means of land production, which has led to a lack of economic activity in Spain. However, all he can do is reduce the burden on farmers, but he cannot shake them in the slightest. Alfonso's reflection on the reasons ultimately stems from the Spanish system. Spain was the earliest country in Europe to achieve absolute monarchy, even earlier than son King Louis XIV. However, the foundation of Spain's monarchy was the nobility and Catholic monks, and during the War of Restoration, the country relied on these two major classes. When American silver flowed in to expand domestic trade and allowed some merchants to rise rapidly, they still maintained the worst privileges. On the contrary, the class foundation of monarchy in the major Western European countries was primarily based on the feudal aristocracy and the bourgeoisie of the new aristocracy. Son King Louis XIV implemented a mercantilist policy and promoted the development of manufacturing and foreign trade through state control, which was conducive to the development of French capitalism. As a result, he gained the support of the emerging bourgeoisie and fought against the traditional aristocratic class. He transferred the power of aristocratic training to bureaucrats while allowing the upper bourgeoisie to rule France according to his own orders, thus achieving the situation of Zheng as the state. After Bourbon took control of Spain, Spain learned from France and gradually changed its traditional policies. The Enlightenment ideas of Paris also gave birth to a group of encyclopedia-style ministers in Spain. The biggest representative of the change was the maintenance of the royal and aristocratic Atlantic trade privileges. The monopoly of Cadiz's trade with the Americas ended, and small and scattered industries developed in various coastal provinces of Spain. Alfonso remembers that in the 1808 Peninsula War, Spain's old system collapsed, and the temporary old government of Spain was driven to Cadiz by Napoleon. It was those councillors from coastal provinces who joined forces and promulgated the Cadiz Constitution, ushering in the constitutional era of Spain. However, compared to their French counterparts, they are still too weak now. 
If it weren't for Napoleon's iron hooves trampling on the old Spanish order too quickly, they wouldn't have had the opportunity to rise to power. However, they are a new emerging force that can break the political order of the Spanish monarchy and nobility. The Spanish system is inherently designed to safeguard the interests of the nobility, and to change it, it is necessary to solve the problem at its root. If we keep it as usual, Alfonso has plenty of time to slowly grind with them, but when he thinks of the monster that the neighboring neighbor is about to explode and give birth to. Alfonso returned to his room and looked at the notes he had written two days ago, the new government model, the Third Council, the French Revolution, and the nobles and the people. He picked up the notes from the Third Council and said, let me take the path that Louis XVI cannot take. Chapter 9 Separation of Powers You are listening at NovelFull.audio If Spain had a good government during the storm of the French Revolution, its geographical location would have made it crucial in various European countries. Because Spain is located in the south of France, although the natural dangers of the Pyrenees Mountains are not as great as those of the English coast, compared to the flat borders of some countries, this is a great compensation for Spain's defense against its northern neighbors. Gibraltar is temporarily ignored, and Spain's actions will determine whether the British Navy can enter the Mediterranean. Should the wheat from North Africa and Sicily be delivered to the Hungary in southern France? Whether to make France feel at ease with the countries behind them, in order to deal with Germans and Italians. In addition, Italy's political structure is similar to that of Germany, splitting into many small states, unlike the strong core forces of Austria and Prussia in the German region, which gives Spain the opportunity to actually control the Mediterranean. But these advantages have all been wasted by poor government and state institutions. At the joint meeting of the Imperial Front Department on April 8, Alfonso prepared materials and first fired a gun, criticizing the Castile Supreme Court with hundreds of conflicting legal provisions in his hand. The law is issued to manage the people, but if even the people cannot understand it, how can they abide by the law, let alone the judges? Among the laws and regulations issued by the High Court, there are 200 completely repeated laws and regulations issued by the royal family, 530 partially repeated laws and regulations, 50 completely contradictory laws and 600 partially contradictory projects. If I remember correctly, the government abolished the law that nobles left over from the Middle Ages could not graze freely on farmland in the early years, but what I did not expect is that the High Court still has the original text of medieval laws. Agriculture is the root of the country, and even this can be confused. I seriously doubt whether the High Court is too idle. We can increase the number of judges in the High Court of Castile. The High Court of Castile not only has to handle Castile affairs, but also manages local courts in Aragon, Catalonia, Valencia, and other places. Too many matters add a heavy burden to judges, suggested José Manrino, who previously served as the Supreme Court of Castile. This is not a temporary solution. If quantity alone can solve the problem, then why do we always cannot besiege Gibraltar? If I remember correctly, in the Great Siege of 1782, we and the French gathered 32,000 troops, but had no choice but to confront the Gibraltar fortress, which was less than 7,000 people. Alfonso was very indifferent and exposed Gibraltar's failure. I think everyone should be aware of this answer. The wealth of nations emphasizes division of labor, believing that division of labor is a product of developed society. The more developed and larger the market, the clearer the division of labor. Therefore, national government institutions are no exception. The High Court has legislative power, local administrative power, and there is a serious overlap with other state institutions. In the future, the High Court will only retain judicial power, clarify division of labor, and take a professional path. Administrative power will be handed over to local provincial governments and city halls. The voices of discussion have drowned out the conference hall, and the High Court not only has local legislative power, but also administrative power to be deprived. Isn't this the separation of powers advocated by Montesquieu? The ministers of the Encyclopedia faction were very excited. 
The High Court, a body that integrates judiciary, legislation, and administration, was similar to ancient Chinese Yaman, but the difference was that they had local legislative power, which had always greatly undermined the royal orders. Generally speaking, local courts will cooperate with the central government, but if it involves group interests, since they have all three powers in one, they can impose positive and negative provisions. The Encyclopedia faction is dominated by the Royalist Party promoted by Carlos III, and for them, strengthening central authority is the best thing. However, there are also rational individuals present. Your Majesty, such a statement would cause great chaos. Many judges in the High Court will lose their jobs and are easily subject to resistance from both the High Court and the District Court, veteran José Marino questioned. Alfonso naturally knew what Manrino meant by chaos. Judges in Spain are also highly professional, and often they buy themselves a noble title. This group of people is the robed nobility, closely connected in the political and legal spheres, and their common marriage alliance takes this relationship to the next level. Although the Spanish monarchy can drive reforms, the underlying forces will affect Spain's political stability, and there is also a risk of unpredictable unrest in the region. I also think of this. These legal talents naturally need them. Just like the Hammurabi Code, Spain must have a basic civil code. I see that Austrians have already taken the lead in unifying the laws of various provinces in Spain, and regulations cannot be superior to them. Looking for a book garden www.jaoshuyuan.com In Spain, studying law is also an elite, wasting elite resources is shameful, and Alfonso will not leave them on the side. So who will formulate this civil code, your majesty? José Marino did not expect that the king had already carefully considered and found a place for the robed nobles, continuing to ask crucial questions. After the meeting, many people accepted the task, and the king listed professional division of labor as a government assessment, requiring each department to cut and merge their managed departments and optimize the government structure in Spain. José Marino invited his friend Campo Manis to stay at the prime minister's residence and was very pleased to say, Your Majesty has reform ideas. I always thought that the separation of powers would be in France, and I didn't expect Spain to catch up with it. Moreover, the king has a global perspective, and the new high court will have old judges and new judges recruited by society in pairs. The old judges will miss the legal hegemony of their own place in the past, and the new judges in society will become supporters of the reform. With the deprivation of local legislative power, the high court will never be able to break through again. What I was worried about before was that the king was young and ambitious, going to learn from Joseph II. Joseph II was too dogmatic and idealistic, even though he was over fifty years old, he never learned what his mother looked like, which led to a rebellion and a decline in prestige among the lowland Hungarian nobility. Our loyal monarch is better than I imagined, Campo Manis said happily. However, your affairs are actually more important than mine. Your Majesty requests an increase in the administrative efficiency of the government. Do you have any ideas? I have a rough idea that Your Majesty wants to assess the progress of our professional division of labor. So why can't we use assessment to whip bureaucrats and establish a unified and effective management and supervision system, as well as regular rules and regulations for promotion, use, rewards and punishments, and appointment and removal? Chapter 10 Third Level Parliament You are listening at NovelFull.audio there is a lot of discussion in the coffee shops in Madrid, where people taste coffee from the small island of West Indies, smoke, read newspapers, discuss politics, and play cards. In the social pastime of the 18th century, gatherings became almost a unique symbol of Spanish life, and people often gathered specifically in coffee shops. Almost every coffee table has the Al Jazeera newspaper, Spain's first comprehensive newspaper covering the peninsula, divided into one newspaper and one issue. The former is mainly a comprehensive newspaper focused on daily life, collecting many cultural and interesting stories from various provinces in Spain as well as national news, which is popular among the general public. The following is Science Popularization Weekly, 
which elaborates on the advanced technology of workers and peasants, explains economic issues and national policies, and also includes some current affairs comments, which are highly sought after by social elites. People can always find topics in newspapers such as military recruitment, priests' expedition to Morocco, and Austrians in the Oolong of the Danube. However, today's publication of the newspaper has focused many discussions on one place. Mr. Moratin, is the news in this newspaper true? Is the king really interested in restoring the legislative power of the third-level parliament? Juan Mercedes, a writer who often publishes his poetry in Peninsula Weekly, enthusiastically asked. On this day, it happened to be a literary symposium held by Peninsula Weekly at the Shihong Café. The editor-in-chief of Peninsula Weekly and also a playwright, Leandro Moratin, was surrounded by everyone. The parliament referred to by Mercedes is the third-level parliament of Spain, dating back to the 12th century. The kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula convened a council of representatives from the church, nobility, and cities when faced with major events such as succession to the throne, pacification of internal strife, and external wars. In the past, it had always been a part of the Spanish national institutions. However, during the reign of Carlos I, he became hostile to the Holy Alliance of Avila, which was represented by cities within the parliament, for various reasons. The parliament opposed the king's abuse of power and a civil war broke out. However, unlike the outcome of the English parliamentary civil war, the Avila Holy Alliance was defeated by a superior force in the Battle of Villarreal. After Carlos I destroyed the alliance's armed resistance, the autonomy privileges of the cities were reduced and soon their influence in parliament was lost. And the nobles who helped Carlos I suppress city representatives were also expelled from parliament because the king said, Nobles, this tax.free group has no reason to participate in parliament. In the end, the parliament simply became the supporting role for holding court ceremonies, but it was different from being abandoned by the French king. Every time the successor to the Spanish throne was determined, the Spanish three-dot-level meeting would be held symbolically, but it was often just a sideshow. To be precise, it's not a third-level council, Moritin corrected the other party's mistake. Friend, you obviously haven't read the content of the newspaper carefully. Just three days ago, Alfonso made two important appointments, namely the Minister of Justice. Due to the reform of the High Court, Although the power has shrunk, it also represents the need for more professional personnel to serve, the Speaker of the Third Level Parliament is different from the honorary profession in the past. The granting of legislative power represents that in the future, the Third Level Parliament will become a position of equal pressure and power. Of course, the King still has the right to revoke legislative power. Both of these positions fall on the nobility, especially those in robes, who can choose between the courts and parliament, judicial and legislative powers. Of course, they also have a third place to go, which is to be responsible for compiling the civil code. Of course, the delegation of power by Alfonso does not mean that there are no conditions. Moritin flipped through an issue of the newspaper. The first level of seats was composed of 30 upright clergy paying taxes from 11 dioceses in the peninsula, the second level is 70 seats for tax-paying, patriotic, and robed nobles, designated by the king, the third level is elected by wealthy and knowledgeable taxpayers with one person, one vote, and a total of 52 seats per province. Since all taxes are to be paid, does your majesty want to completely abolish the tax exemption privileges of the nobility? Alongside, Hieronimo Fijo, who wrote The General Critique of the Battlefield, noticed some specific words. Integrity, patriotism, wealth, and knowledge. Your Majesty is delineating the scope, and I'm afraid some people will not agree to the specified conditions. If you don't want to, you can only be absent, which is equivalent to abstaining, and it's like giving others an advantage. Moritin replied, nobles and clergy are already needed to serve the country and sympathize with the weak. The biggest difference here is that each level as a whole only has one vote, voted according to the number of people. Although they don't have the right to propose, the majority of the proposals must be approved by 60%. In this way, neither the second level nor the third level can meet this requirement, 
neither exceeding half. They must win over people from other levels and look for the book garden www.xiaoshuyuan.com, maybe they will need the king's ruling in the future. And I found that the representation of clergy does not exceed 20%, is there a special arrangement? Mercedes keenly felt the art of numbers. The king granted priests the right to participate in the third rank, and the current third rank council is the first step for us to step into direct political participation. Think about it, how much time did the British Parliament spend fighting for power, or was it because of a civil war that gave rise to the Magna Carta? His Majesty, beside Carlos III, has always received education in French thought and is very friendly to us. The Peninsula Weekly has given us the opportunity to spread our voice, which is a rare opportunity. We hope that everyone can publish more poems and operas to praise this progress belonging to Spain. Moritin is very excited, and his excitement has also infected many literary writers present. Peninsula Weekly can be said to have become the largest platform for the dissemination of Spanish Enlightenment ideas by the end of this century. In the past, some criticized and satirized idle nobles and superstitious monks were often sued by the nobility and the church, and some newspapers couldn't resist the pressure and stopped publishing. Unless you have a platform, and no one's platform is as hard as the current king's platform. Therefore, Peninsula Weekly has gathered many authors who often anonymously publish their articles, satirizing the church and nobility, and almost all Spanish book and newspaper censorship is granted, demonstrating the current king's open attitude towards social thought. Literary writers are taking action in society, while traditional aristocrats with lagging news find themselves out of this stage. The nobles protested repeatedly, and according to management, they should have noble seats, but now the second level is only represented by those judges and nobles. Running to the court every day and arguing with the judges and nobles, who could have imagined that they were once a community of interests?